so glad that you decided to join us at the crossing this weekend. For those of you who are joining us online, we're excited that you're fellowshipping with us. For those of you who are catching up with the crossing on YouTube, we're excited about you. And for those of you who are joining us at all of our locations, we're so glad that we get to be in relationship with you guys. And my prayer is that God would do an incredible work in every single one of you this weekend. In fact, right now, we're in a series called Unleashed. And we're examining three areas of the Christian life where Satan wants to do everything in his power to keep us bound, to keep us shackled, to keep us tied up. Because he knows that if we were to be unleashed in these three areas, it would be a game changer. Last week, if you were here, Jerry talked about how we've been unleashed to serve. And this week, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that if we were unleashed in this area, it would change absolutely everything. In fact, the issue we're going to discuss this weekend is the linchpin in this series. That if we get this right, serving is going to take care of itself. If we get If we get this right next week when Jerry shares about going, going will will take care of itself. If we get get this right, and at all of our locations, I am so glad that you decided to come this weekend. Because we have an incredible opportunity to take God at his word in this area. And if if we do that, I believe it will produce tremendous benefits and if we choose to ignore God's word in this area it'll have devastating consequences because what we're going to talk about today is going to affect your relationship with Jesus Christ what we're going to talk about today will drastically affect your marriage What you do with the subject matter is going to affect your kids. It's going to affect this church as a whole and how we honor God. What you do, the decision you make at all of our weekend services, it's going to impact this community. It will directly impact What kind of world do you leave behind? And perhaps more importantly, what we do with this subject matter, I believe, will directly impact the number of people that get to experience heaven. We can't can't sidestep this. We got to own it. And I, I come to you this weekend with a heavy heart. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, i got to be honest on the front end. There have been times in my relationship with Jesus Christ where I operated in complete disobedience in this area. I knew what I was supposed to do, and I I just didn't do it. Other times, I... It just kind of got lost in all the craziness, and I neglected to do what God called me to do, and I just, I just lost focus. For those of you who are, who are joining us at all, all of our different locations, and you're, maybe you're joining us online, and you're not a Christian yet, you're kind of on the fence trying to explore some of this stuff, uh, I want to kind of have a heart-to-heart with you here on the, on the front end before we even get into this subject matter, you need to know something. That as Christians, we don't always get it right. As Christians, we we sometimes really mess it up. And we need moments like this to get our, our lives and our relationship with Jesus back on track. And I need you to have, have grace for us as we're trying to do that today. Another thing I, I need to tell you is that because as Christians we've messed this up at times, you may have been hurt, offended, 
confused. And for that, I, I want to apologize. Because that wasn't our intention. I, I know that we don't claim to be perfect, but sometimes you deserve better from us. And because of our struggle in this area, we probably messed some things up for you. And you just needed to know, uh, I'm sorry. The other thing is that my hope is that one day you're going to discover what we've discovered about Jesus. And that if you could, if you could still pay attention to this sermon, and you could implement it into your life, when you become a follower, you would spare yourself some of the pain and regret that the rest of us are about ready to experience. And you wouldn't have to have some of the same conviction that some of us are about ready to feel. Last thing is I need you to at least pay attention till the end of the sermon. For those of you who are, who are still trying to give this Jesus thing a, a whirl, you're kind of, because I'm going to be asking you, to, I'm going to ask you to be patient and just listen in while we kind of just handle some church business. But on the back end of this, uh, there's something really, really important that I got to tell you. And so I'm going to ask you, even if you're going, well, I'm not a Christian yet, just, just hang in. I'll try and make this as bearable as possible. Okay? Some of you might be going, well, what in the world are we talking about? I mean, that has got to be the world's longest intro to a sermon at the crossing ever. But if you're ready for the message, I'm ready to give it to you. Here's my sermon in a sentence. Every single one of you has been unleashed to disciple. Every single one of you has been unleashed to disciple. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, we find these words. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Some of you might be going, really? All this intro for that? I've got that verse memorized. I didn't even need the words on the screen. I got that down pat. That's pretty important stuff. Well, hear me. Jesus expects his followers to disciple. It's his expectation. Question. You can answer. Pay attention. According to that passage of scripture, if you go to heaven, who's in charge? Jesus is. All authority in heaven. Okay. Okay. Jesus if you go to earth, who's in charge? Jesus. Some of you are slow on the uptake. That's okay. Jesus. Where are we right now? We're on earth. Who's in charge? Jesus. And what has he commanded us to do? Make disciples. He expects every single one of us to participate in the making of disciples. These are his last recorded words on earth before he leaves and goes to heaven. These are the marching orders for the Jesus followers. Go and make disciples. And if you call yourself a Christian and you are not making disciples, you are living in disobedience. If you call yourself a Jesus follower and you're not making disciples, the only conclusion that I can draw is that we are not doing the things that our commanding officer has asked us to do. And here's the deal. There's a reason why so many of us 
are not making disciples. It's because Satan knows that if we got serious about making disciples, it would change everything. And so he has begun and has been weaving these lies into your life and into mine to get us sidetracked, derailed from doing the thing that God has commanded us to do through his son Jesus. And what I want to do is I just kind of want to expose some of these lies that Satan's been feeding you and you've been taking hook, line, and sinker. And every single one of us at some point in our life, we've, we've fallen victim to one of, these, one of these lies. The first one is that I don't know enough to disciple. If I were to take a straw poll at all of our locations and make you all raise your hand, how many of you in here don't think you know enough to be a disciple? It would amaze you how many hands would go up. Because we naturally don't think that we have enough, that we know enough about Jesus to actually benefit somebody else. But God never calls you to something that he doesn't equip you to accomplish. God will never call you to something that he will not equip you to accomplish. So if God says you are to make disciples, he will support you in that process. He will be with you in that journey. In fact, never does God hold us accountable to the things we don't have. He always asks us to be faithful with what we do have. Some of you may remember when we went through the story last year as a church, when God came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to lead my people. Moses came up with a list of all the things he didn't have. And then God said, well, Moses, what do you have? And Moses like, I got a stick in my hand. And God said, I can use it. You may remember when Jesus was uh, preaching to the 5,000 and everybody got hungry. And the disciples were like, we got to get these guys some to eat. And he goes, uh, well, you give them something to eat. And they go, well, all we got is this little boy's sack lunch. It's a little bit of fish, a little bit of bread. God goes, I can use it. It was when the widow came into contact with the prophet, and she was in dire need. The prophet turned to the widow and said, well, what do you have? She goes, all I have is just this little small jar, jar of oil. Okay. God always, always uses what you have. And when it comes to making disciples, what do you have? Did you show up for church last week? Well, then you have last week's message. Did you spend time reading your Bible this week? Then you have that time that you spent in the Word. Did you spend time praying this week? Then you have that to offer. God will take what you have in your possession, in your spiritual possession, and he will use it. And oftentimes, he'll supersize it. That if you would just take what you have, if you've said yes to Jesus, you've bought in and said, okay, God, I want you to start transforming my life. And as he transforms your life, the expectation is for you to show other people the work he's doing in your life and help them navigate the very same thing. Now, the, the, the second lie that we... Uh, that we believe from Satan is that I don't have enough time to disciple. And I'm softer on the time thing now. Five years ago, if Clayton was preaching this sermon, when I was single and in ministry, I'd have, I'd have come undone on you. But that was before I got married, three kids, two in diapers, a teenager who needs to go hither and everywhere. And I get busy between practices, games, rehearsals, laundry, grocery shopping, diapers, laundry, it, you're busy. I get it. I get that you're busy. But I have found that I make time for the things that are important to me. And if you are too busy to do the things that God has commanded you to do, You may need to let some of those other things go. I'm not asking you to be a bad parent. I'm not asking you to be a bad spouse. I'm not asking you to be a bad person. I'm asking you for your godly desire 
to love him, to, to follow him, to impact your priorities. Man, I, God never asked you to be the coach of every single sporting event for your kid. He did ask you to make disciples. He didn't ask you to make sure that your daughter was a really good tumbler. But he did ask you to make disciples. And if you can manage tumbling and making disciples, awesome. If you can't, make disciples. Because when you get to heaven, you don't get to go, well, Jesus, watch my daughter dance. <laughs> I mean, it may be cute. He'll like it. But it, uh, he'll be like, well, okay, well, awesome. But what did you do with the thing I, I commanded you to do? What did you do with that? Now, the, the next the next lie is that uh, I can't disciple because I wasn't discipled. And that one resonates with me. Not once, not ever, in the history of my life has anybody come up to me and said, Clayton, I want to disciple you. And all of a sudden I found myself in this discipleship relationship. It never, it never, it never happened. And I, I could write myself a permission slip, couldn't I? Well, because I wasn't discipled, I, 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 don't, I can't disciple other people. But that's not what Jesus asked us to do. He just says, make disciples. And I have to realize that while I may not have been discipled in the way that perhaps I desired to be discipled, I had godly parents. I had a father who kept the, his Bible on the little hump in the, in the explorer and he would pray when we were driving places, and he would teach me about God, and my mom and dad wanted me to be in a relationship with God and in a relationship with the church, and when I went to college, nobody said, hey, Clayton, I'm going to disciple you, but when I came to the crossing, one of the things I love is that our senior pastor, Jerry Harris, invested in me, and it may come as a surprise, I'm not all that easy to invest in, Okay? I'm not all fun, I'm, I'm, I'm challenges, I'm struggles. But Jerry, he never said, Clayton, and you will be my, dis no, he, he didn't, we, not even once. He did say, hey, do you wanna hop in the car with me? And when he was going to visit somebody in the hospital, he does sit down with the executive team every week and we talk about ministry and we talk about life and we talk about challenges and we're growing and pushing and challenging one another. So I, while I didn't have that discipleship moment, I, I have been invested in. And some of you, you may be tempted to write yourself the permission slip here, but listen, the frustration you are feeling about not being discipled is not an excuse to pass that frustration on to those that will come after you. You hear me? We can make disciples. We can do it. We can go out and we can lean in and we can invest and we can make disciples. Now, here's the fourth one, and this is where everybody is going to like pack their bags and leave the church. So I'll sit. Sweetly. Here is one of the lies that Satan has got you to believe that you can call yourself a mature Christian and not disciple anyone. One of the lies, perhaps the very best lie, that he has spoon-fed the church is that we can call ourselves these spiritually mature followers and at the same time not disciple anyone. bugs me. It hurts me that we have people in our church that have been Christians for years and they are selfishly sitting in a small group when they could be selflessly leading one. It bugs me. It hurts me as a pastor that we have people that, that have an understanding of God that can, that can do things with their understanding of God to benefit other people, but it's, it's still very much about them. 
At the crossing, we define spiritual maturity as it's not about you. And what's happened is, is Satan has crept into the Great Commission, and he has highlighted and underlined the word teach in the Great Commission and made that really, really important, which we turned into to study and Bible study and more knowledge about Christ instead of becoming more Christ-like. You want an exercise, read all the Gospels and see how many chapters you can read about Jesus and not read about his disciples. Jesus was constantly making disciples, but we have spent so much time wanting to learn more, wanting to know more. And Corinthians tells us that knowledge puffs up, but it's love that, that builds up. Your knowledge of God could make you arrogant. It could make, if you're not careful, it could make you prideful. And I worry sometimes that it's going to make you so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. But your love for God and of God will motivate you to build, to build his church, to build his kingdom, to invest in the next generation. That's what's supposed to happen. It's like you meet somebody and all they want to do is talk about how much they love to cook. And oh, I love cooking. Oh, I, I just love to get in my kitchen. I just love to stir it up. I love cooking. I just love making meals for people. I love doing it all the time. And then you call them up and you're like, well, I got some hungry people that need fed. And the cook is a no-show. But they'll sure show up for the church cooking class. Now, are we supposed to dice the bell peppers or slice the bell peppers? Well, I got some hungry people over here. Well, when you, when you like to cook, do you use flour for your base or do you use cornstarch? Because I'm a cor cornstarch person myself. No, I, I have hungry people that need fed. And I need you to spend less time talking about how much you love to cook and I need you to cook. I need you to serve something up hot and fresh. I need you to cook. Or imagine it like a uh, spiritual buffet. And all the spiritually obese people just waddle up to the line. Technically, my daughter got one of these BMI things, and I classify in the obese category now, so I can make all these jokes. You waddle up. And you got all these spiritually obese people going through the spiritual buffet, and they're just eating. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, Greek word. Mm, mm. Love it. By all. Oh, mm. They get all the way through the line. And the spiritually malnourished people show up, and there's no food left. Then all the chunky Christians, while they're wiping enough food on their sleeve that could feed a family of four, they turn around and they look at all the spiritually malnourished people. And they go, oh my goodness, look at, look at how skinny they are. Somebody should do something. It's like the people who, who come into my office and I have to pray for the fruit of the Holy Spirit as someone looks at me and says, I'm just worried about this church, Clayton. I just don't want this church to be a a mile wide and an inch deep. And then when you ask them to disciple and do something about it, no show. And if you are in that category, as one of the pastors of this church, I plead with you, not just for you, but for the people that you pretend to care about, that you would repent. That you say, I'm tired. I'm tired of being in disobedience to God's plan. I'm tired of neglecting the spiritually malnourished. I'm tired of just looking at the problem, and I want to be a part of the solution. That's my heart's desire. Because I believe that if we get this right, it will change us. And one of the common problems is that we 
over-spiritualize discipleship. In my opinion, discipleship is actually relatively simple. Before you can make disciples, you actually need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know if that catches anybody by surprise, but I think it's really hard to help people find Jesus if you haven't found him yourself. And then what you have to do, these are all from my house. My wife is probably watching right now going, where is all of our stuff? Okay. We do have more than four glasses at our house, I hope. Okay. So this is you. This is spiritual you. And here's what happens. When you become a Christian, you start letting people pour into you. So if you showed up for church this weekend, you got spiritually poured into. If you read your Bible this week, you were spiritually poured into. If you have somebody in your life who will invest in you. See, God's plan for discipleship is that you would always have somebody investing in you and you would always have somebody that you're investing in. So you'd have somebody come up to you and they would invest in your life. Maybe there's a great Christian book that you're reading or you're doing a a daily devotional. This is somebody investing in your life. And this is what happens. All this pouring in happens. Now here's what happens if you're spiritually obese. You just keep pouring in. Oh, can I get another Greek word? And then what you end up doing is you end up just making a mess because you've let all of this stuff come in, but you've never let it go out. Discipleship is when you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pour out into other people. Husbands, the first place that you pour out is you pour out into your wife. You say, sweetie, I love you. I'm going to spend some time praying with you. Let's go to small group together. Let's invest in one another. Let's grow spiritually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead my family spiritually. Then what happens is you and your wife, your second greatest priority is you start investing in your kids. You start praying with them, showing them how to live a godly life. And after you get that in check, not before, before you have the ability to lead other people spiritually, you need to take care of most important, take care of the house. But then after that, there are people that God has placed in your life that you start pouring into. And oh no, what happened? You're on empty. Well, what do you do? You go to the people that God has placed in your life, you go to church, you spend time reading your Bible, and you start letting them fill you back up, but not just so you can get full, but so that you can pour back out. Chances are right now, if I were to say, actually I will just say this, think right now of a person that you could disciple. For a lot of you in here, that was not a hard leap. You're going, oh yeah, I want that person to know more about Jesus. Do you care about that person? Do you believe that that person will be, will be better off if they have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ? And let me ask you this question. What happens if you don't disciple them? Last year at our church, we had almost a 1,000 people accept Jesus Christ. Those baptism videos were overwhelming. Do you think God could use you to help take some of these people who are brand new in their faith and at least take them to where you're at? You better believe you could. God would love to use you in that way. And I've found out that I learn more about God as I try to teach other people about God. And here at The Crossing, we talk about relational discipleship because we believe that uh, discipleship can't happen outside of relationship. And my desire for every single one of you is for you to blow up your campus pastor or your discipleship pastor's calendar over the next couple of weeks. Call them up, text them, email them, show up unannounced. If that happens, I apologize, campus pastors and small group guys. And show up and say, hey, I'm tired of living in disobedience. I'm tired of sinning. I'm tired of sitting on the sidelines. And I'm ready to be a discipler. Will you help me? Oh my goodness. If we started doing that, hang on. Because this church would blow up. You would change this community. If we got a bunch of people, and every single one of you, if you put your own pants on, you can disciple somebody. Even if you can't, you could probably throw it a whirl. I mean, you can do this. In fact, I want you to say this with me right now. I can disciple. I 
can disciple. I'm going to make you say it till you believe it. I can disciple. That's exactly right. You're a disciple maker. God put it in you. You have the capabilities. You have the talents because you can disciple. It's because of what God does for you that every single one of you can disciple. It's because he's placed his Holy Spirit in you that you can disciple. It's because he will never set his children up for failure that every single one of you can disciple. But the question we have to answer is not can I disciple, but will I disciple? Because you could just show up for services this weekend and shamefully and sinfully walk out choosing not to. But I am telling you, with all the optimism that I possess, that I believe not only can you disciple, but you will. In fact, I just want you to say this right now I will disciple. I will disciple. In fact, I'm going to give you a list of reasons why you're going to disciple. And when I get done giving you this reason, I want you to say back to me that you can disciple. It is because of God's power that I will disciple. I want you to say, I will disciple. I will disciple. It is because I've been rescued by a loving God that I will disciple. It is because I'm done making excuses that I will disciple disciple. It's because I'm done believing Satan's lies that I will disciple. It's because Jesus says I can that I will disciple. It's because my family needs me to that I will disciple. It's because this church needs me to that I will disciple. It's because this world is waiting for me to that I will disciple. And it is because my commander in chief, Jesus Christ, has commanded me to, that I will disciple. And I tell you what, church, I'm preaching. I don't know if you're hearing me. But in heaven, they've been waiting for a church to say those three words. They've been looking down going, when? When will a church pick up this message that they've memorized and finally put it into practice? And there are cheers right now for people just like you who are recognizing that not only can I, but I'm crossing the line and I will. And we're moving to a time, a decision.